following program is a peer-to-peer -peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. Hello, listeners around the world on radio streaming and podcast services. This is It's Not Therapy. I'm Leanna Kersner, and I am not a therapist, but I am your source for navigating the madness of mental health using my top 10 sayings for checking in with your best self. This week, we're talking about mental health and consent. You're going to hear less from me than usual because I have two guests this episode. Poppy, not her real name, who is a therapist, unlike me, who is not a therapist, and Poppy's fiance, Zena, both of whom have mental and physical health conditions that can and have impacted their ability to consent to major things like sexual encounters. What you're going to hear this episode is harrowing and complicated, which is why they're perfect guests for this issue, which is harrowing and complicated. Statistically, we know that people with mental health conditions are more likely to be the victims of crime than the perpetrators, but we only have glimpses into how much more likely. According to one study I found, 40% 40% of the women surveyed with mental health conditions had been victims of sexual assault. The control group, women surveyed without a diagnosis, 7%. That's a huge gap. Consent from a legal perspective and consent from a social and mental health perspective are very different things. Plenty of legal activities still violate consent. And because of the culture war surrounding sex education in schools, many people aren't taught the basics of consent at home or at school. And because of the misappropriation of mental health language, even people who seem extremely knowledgeable get consent wrong. I had to do an emergency session over the weekend with a client because he was repeatedly exposed to sexual images without his consent. And when he complained about this, the people posting the, the images accused him of censorship and bigotry. It upset him so badly he said, I quote, he wanted to walk into traffic. So what is consent? Consent must be mutual, which means everyone involved agrees to what's happening. Continuous, meaning you can be okay with it one minute and not okay with it the next, and that's valid. You can eat out. Specific, saying yes to one thing does not mean yes to everything. That's tied into consent is stoppable. Again, anyone can change their minds at any time. No means no. Stop means stop. Cut it out means cut it out. And consent must be actively communicated. That means silence or a lack of resistance. That doesn't mean proceed. But that's not what we see in the media, right? On TV... In movies, two or more people see each other, breathe the same air, and the next thing we know, they're in bed together or some other location having sex with greater or less of degrees of dysfunction. We rarely see communicated specific consent in media. We see that implied consent where nobody says, is this okay? And nobody says, yes. We see that as, quote unquote, more romantic. We, I don't. But some people even find talking about sex before they do it so that everybody knows what the other person will enjoy. They find that annoying. Ah, the word annoying, one of my least favorite words. What's more annoying, having an adult conversation about sex? Because you're mature enough to have adult conversations if you're mature enough to have sex, right? Right? Or is it more annoying to have the consequences of skipping that step and accidentally violating someone's sexual or emotional boundaries. A lot of people have the crazy ex story, and some of them are legit. A lot of them are legit. But there's a reason I separate good crazy from bad crazy on this show. There's no such thing as too sensitive when it comes to sexual emotional consent. 
someone is not less enlightened because they don't want to perform a particular sex act. And it's never, ever okay to lie to someone to get them to consent or threaten to leave them if they don't. It's never okay to shame someone over their sexual preferences or even shame them because they said something hurt or went too far. And yet these lawful but awful violations of boundaries happen all the time, even in enlightened left-wing communities. So after the break, I'm going to introduce you to Poppy and Zena. Poppy is trans and Zena is non-binary and they're engaged and polyamorous. And Poppy is a therapist who has experienced firsthand a situation where she wasn't capable of consenting temporarily and someone who was given the opportunity to know better crossed lines i'll let them tell their story after this questions comments concerns liana at not show.com or just go to the website fill our, our contact form not show.com at not therapy show on access twitter instagram and threads be right back on this episode about mental health and consent The following program is a peer-to-peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. We're back on Insta Therapy. I'm still Leanna Kersner. I'm still not a therapist. We are still talking mental health, mental illness, and consent. And I have hyped these guests from the beginning of the show. I am super stoked. We've got Poppy and her fiance, Zena, on the show. Poppy is a, a therapist. She is a therapist. I am not a therapist. Poppy is a therapist. Zena is her fiance. And they are here to talk mental health and consent because both of them are consenting adults but they also have various conditions that sometimes make consent challenging poppy xena how would you describe your situations in that regard so um by the way i'm poppy and um i uh i guess on my side of things i would say that uh so as far as my diagnoses uh i am diagnosed with um borderline personality disorder um, which is a disorder that deals with incredibly strong reactions to abandonment. Um, it's usually characterized by potentials for self-harm and suicide, uh, vague sense of self, uh, a tendency towards black and white thinking. Um, it can lead to things like paranoid ideations or dissociation. It can also lead to, you know, mood issues, things like that, emotional ability where emotions can change at the drop of a hat, sometimes for no reason. Love that. And so that can definitely affect how consent and how relationships function. Um, Zizi, do you want to talk about kind of briefly just what you deal with? Yeah. um, So I'm Zina, or Zizi for short, if you're Poppy. Uh, And I deal with PMDD, premenstrual dysphoria disorder. Uh, Basically, about a week before your period starts, your body cannot handle its own hormones and just goes nuts. Uh, And so it can look similar to BPD, frankly, but it's still its own thing long-lasting really intense moods um and that could be happy moods sad moods angry moods they all can be intense um one of the things that you know the community talks about is that don't make any big decisions during pmdd because you never really know if afterwards how you're going to feel about something and even just for the sake of like the best way to handle something is probably easier done outside of pmdd when your hormones are not freaking the out mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um you know, and so you can get mood kind of changes, body changes, appetite changes, all of that with PMDD, and it just messes with everything. Mm-hmm. Um, the other actually thing that we deal with that I don't think you and I even think about super hard anymore is migraines mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. terms of consent. Um, that's one that we've always had to be really careful with over the years is just the chronic illness. When a migraine's coming on and you start feeling a little bit fuzzy brained or a little bit out of it, like that's our cue to kind of start being careful with ourselves. Migraines change like all of your functioning ability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the challenge, right? It's being aware that sometimes it's not a good time to make decisions, but sometimes you're not always aware you're in that mode, especially in the early, I mean, I've got a a friend, he's Mm -hmm. been on the show who has BPD and it's a challenge. And sometimes Mm -hmm. he's just not his best self. And, you know, he came and he said, sometimes the best place for me is hospitalization. He was very blunt about that. But that in-between phase where 
you might not catch it. I mean, you guys are probably both pros at this time. Zena. I know you've warned me about the PMDD. It's like, it's coming on. I want to warn people, which I really appreciate it. Cause in that case you can contextualize it. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's interesting that people, even people with a diagnosis themselves or who identify as mentally ill don't necessarily get the impact on consent. And this is something, mm -hmm. you know, disclaimer again, People with a diagnosis can consent when they are regulated. There are times, and this is what I want to get into, when everybody with a, a but I mean, I have PTS. I say when I'm regulated, I have PTS. <laughs> PTSD is the problem. I can't make any decisions right now. This ain't good. What do you want people to know about consent with the various things, what to look for, what to do if you have a loved one or a friend with a condition like BPD, bipolar disorder is another one. Mm -hmm. Some of the other personality, I uh, hate personality disorder, but that's the term we're stuck with. What should people know about when consent can be given and when it can't be? So again, I'm a big fan of the idea of like knowing is half the battle, like the old G.I. Joe thing. Um, and so like to me, it's like, well, if you have a partner, right, I'm not talking about like a random hookup or anything, but if you're talking about like a partner who is a regular partner and they have confided in you, they have a diagnosis, I think it is on the responsibility of that partner to learn about that diagnosis and understand the ways that that can impact the relationship. And one of the ways that, you know, mental illness can impact a relationship is through consent. Mm -hmm. um, if someone is having a, you know, is schizophrenic and unregulated, their consent is basically nullified. Like we don't know what's going on in their head. We don't know if they're going, if they're going through a full blown, you know, hallucinogenic, you know, hallucination based episode. Like mm -hmm. we're, there's not much to be done there. I've dealt with those folks in, in CMH before. In the case of like bipolar, if someone's in a manic episode, then like we have to consider the idea of, you know, are they just doing risk taking actions because they want to, or is this because this is part of the mania? And then we have to assess, you know, is this is this person actually making decisions for themselves? And sometimes we may have to make a decision for them. Mm -hmm. Um, because you know, situations are not always clean, they're not always simple. Sometimes people don't understand why you're saying this or don't want to do these things. Borderline's a very complicated one for me because um, I have a particular story, which we can get into a little bit later, but mm -hmm. like um, I have a particular story around that where uh, my diagnosis of borderline compromised my own consent and I didn't really figure it out until, um, actually I talked to you, Leon. I opened that, my big fat mouth, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, and yeah, so I'll get into the story a little bit later, but the central sure. version of it is, is that like realizing that just because an action feels off, but you can't put your finger on to why doesn't mean you are granting consent. And especially in the, in the hindsight, knowing that full situation, there were issues of duplicity. There were issues of, uh, coercion, the relationship in question, yeah. literally. Yeah. Coercion. And, and I don't know if even if that kind of coercion was intentional, I'll never know. But in this case, it was because the relationship was hanging on by a thread. And which means that a person with borderline due to that fear of abandonment, will literally right. do anything to maintain that. So right. consent goes out the window, like just completely. So so to me, it comes down to understand what your partner's dealing with and understand yourself too. Understand like what it is that you are, you're dealing with and what you look like unregulated so you can make the best decisions possible. Mm -hmm. I will absolutely suggest anyone that is in a relationship with somebody else who has borderline also get therapy for themselves. Like you are going to be dealing with a new thing um and again times where somebody is dealing with like very severe like attachment issues or having panic attacks or any of that kind of thing and making sure that you are at a place that you can handle that stuff is really important making sure that you can navigate it and not get like sucked into whatever's going on that's that's a big deal um on my end even some of the building blocks is having people doing enough research to have a really good understanding of okay of things like what symptoms of like dissociation are what symptoms of like a panic mm. attack or a flashback are if your partner deals with this making sure that you understand what it looks like in them um because a lot of the times you know you don't it's hard to know at first mm -hmm. and so you're going to start putting together all the little context clues until you finally have a big enough picture of oh that's what's going on right now 
right? And sometimes it's hard to notice when somebody is in that state at first because they're not always giving a lot of outward signals, even if they're at internals are screaming. Mm -hmm. I'm one of those, my internals can be screaming and I could be panicked, but I will look calm on the outside and I don't even know how that works, but it, that's a thing that happens. Uh, and Poppy's like, but Zeta, I didn't notice, like, like you looked normal. And I'm like, oh, whoops, that was not what was going on inside. Yeah, and that, that I, I mean, consent as a culture we are bad at. Our media is really toxic about it. A lot of people don't understand it. When you dive into the statistics on uh, sexual assault, a lot of first-time offenders don't realize they're violating consent. They think they're being romantic. Yep. Um, it's just a, an education thing. But with, with people with mental illness, the statistics are quite stark. One study said 40% of mentally ill women have at least one you know, experience of sexual assault as opposed to 7% of the control population. That's a shocking number. Mm -hmm. So where do you begin to let people know they're doing it right? Yeah, I don't, it's one of those things where I don't even know that there's necessarily a right. I just know when it's like right. wrong or when it's more into like the toxic spectrum. Mm -hmm. Like, I think the big thing for me is, is that this stuff is always going to be very, you know, complicated and going to have a lot of different moving parts. And part of it is, is like, again, communication is really super important on these, on these fronts. I think the thing for me is, is that how do you know you're doing it right? I, I think if both people are educated about the, the, the person's mental illness, that is, they've both done their due diligence to understand what's hap what's happening, what's going on. Like ZZ said, looking at the, some of the symptoms of that, such as a panic attack or things like that. Like, do you know what it looks like when your partner with BPD is splitting? Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that? Um, these are things that like Z like Zena and I worked on very early into our relationship. We made like ID, you know, like little uh, three by five cards that had like, these are interventions that work really well when I'm dealing with X. Now for um, people who know what splitting is, what is splitting? So in the nine criteria for um, borderline personality disorder, the second one is listed as a tendency to go to extremes, usually black and white thinking in the form of either idealization or devaluation. I don't like that language because it's yeah. a little obfuscating. I prefer the term sort of, um, I would say probably infatuation and like demonization because that's really what it comes up more as is essentially think of it as any person you look at while in a split is going to probably ping one or one or two directions. Um, they're either going to be perfect, in which case you don't notice their flaws, you you uh, minimize things about them that are issues or red flags. Mm -hmm. Get to that in a bit. Um and then uh, if you're in a black split, which is what I call them versus, versus you know, a white split versus mm -hmm. a black split, a black split tends to be you demonizing the other person. That is, there's there's no good to this person. This person is is utterly irredeemable. Um, and so Obviously, the issue with it, splitting is, is that it tends to be cyclical. So a good example would be is um, a problem that people with borderline can get into that I think is important for partners to know about is. So at the beginning of the cycle, someone can go into a white split, idealize and super love their partner, infatuate the whole nine yards. And then they'll start doing things for them and they'll do things for them. And then what will happen is eventually they'll start to feel resentful because they feel like they're being taken advantage of or the other person doesn't tell them for the 80th time at a boy or whatever it is. And what happens is, is they essentially then the needle buries the other direction because now they don't feel like they're being loved, taken care of. They feel like the other person's disconnecting. And so what they end up doing is creating, a, in some cases, a self-fulfilling prophecy where they become afraid that the other person's going to leave them because of that disconnection, the reason the needle dropped the other direction. And what happens is, is they go, well, they're going to leave me anyway, so I'm going to treat them like crap. And then what ends up happening is, is the other person eventually gets sick of their shit and leaves. Mm -hmm. So Hence the pattern of unstable relationships. Correct. Yeah. For me, the big one is being, you know, learning, uh, this took me a while, but learning how to avoid um, falling into black splits. Uh, white splits are still very difficult. Idealiz idealization is still something I struggle with, but like watching for that black and white thinking, watching for the way that I think about or I interact with another person is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I would describe splitting as a whole. 
how do you go into it? That's got to be scary long term, never being sure if it really is, you know, the romance of the century or you're just white splitting. Yeah, it's it's my own personal hell. Um, I'll give you a good example. Like, so this kind of gets into the story I was going to bring up. Mm-hmm. You know what? This is probably a good time to take a break before we get into the story of doom so hang on questions comments concerns for poppy xena or me liana at not therapy show.com not therapy show.com fill out the contact form on the website uh be back after this talking mental health when someone can consent and when they can't on it's not therapy The following program is a peer-to-peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. We're back on It's Not Therapy. I'm still Leanna Kirsner. I'm still not a therapist. We're still in the interview and I'm still talking to Poppy, a legit therapist, unlike me who's not a therapist, and her fiance, Zena. And... I, I'm going to put a listener discretion advised on this part of the interview because we're going to talk about some stuff where consent was violated. So when we talk about this, I come at it from sort of two angles. One is that um, there's myself as a clinician who's trained in dealing with trauma, with personality disorders, ADHD. And so there's that side of it where I understand it on a clinical level. There's a big difference between the clinical level and the experience of it yeah. in the moment dealing with it. And the best example I have of this, because I can I can point out any relationship I've been in and see you know bits of this, but the most recent one, I started a relationship at the beginning of September um, with another trans woman who uh, about, I don't know, like nine years younger than me. She's like 33. And... Um, 34 now, I guess. Uh, But she and I got into a relationship and there's this thing within borderline circles where we talk about the idea of an FP, which stands for favored person. person. Most most people who have BPD usually have one. Uh, What a favored person is, is essentially imagine somebody who just seems to hook right into your psychological background, your baggage. You um, click with them. Do you just click with them on a way that is, you know, sometimes sometimes can be very unhealthy. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's not necessarily, but you click with them in a way that is incredibly intense. So all of your symptoms become more so. Um, the issue with the person I started dating, I'm going to call her no, is um, um, almost immediately she became an FP, which was difficult because up until then, my only one had been Xena. So mm-hmm. I suddenly went from one to two, which was something I had never experienced before. So for people who might be a little confused right now, you guys are polyamorous. Correct. We are polyamorous. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, and so the issue came down to is as the relationship progressed, mm-hmm. I found myself torn between my two partners. Um, but the additional problem was, is that the person in question, despite how much I had idealized them and how much, how much of a white split I was in for all mm-hmm. that time, I was so lost in that that I didn't realize how toxic things were for me. And there were two major, major abusive aspects of the relationship. One of them was um, a sort of underlying negligence, like a, a level of neglect where no matter how close I got to this person, they were always at arm's distance. It always felt like there was a, a disconnect because I could never feel like I could make a solid connection. I always felt anxious, nervous, and afraid that at any moment the relationship was going to disappear. And so right. there's this, so that, so that, that's the start. Where the relationship got really problematic was she would occasionally say things that were either really inappropriate or uh, at least inappropriate for myself or were just flat out boundary crosses that had been discussed. The most right. notable one was... What's that? Some things were just mean. Well, no, sometimes she would get, yeah, she would she would yeah. have her own stuff and get very mean. But um, the biggest one that comes to mind with that situation, and this kind of leads to the larger consent discussion, is mm-hmm. um, during the whole of that relationship, I didn't feel like I could leave. Mm. Um, this is often true with people with borderline where the fear of abandonment is more powerful than the, than the, the harm or toxicity you're receiving from the relationship. This is why we're much more likely to be the victims of relational abuse rather than tends to be the ones that do it um yeah, yeah it's it sounds like it was codependent 
it was very codependent. Yeah. The two of us talked almost all the time. We were constantly on Discord together. It was it was it was a nearly all the time thing. And so and both of us engaged in this. Yeah, I should I should clarify just to you know full yeah, disclosure yeah, when mentioning this former partner's any sort of mental illness, anything like that. You are not diagnosing her. It's just sort of. I'm only going uh, by the, I'm only going to talk about the information right. that I have. The, the only right. information I have is that I know what she thinks she has. She has no formal diagnoses. There we go. Um, that that is what I'm going yeah. off by. Yeah. Uh, and and again, I want to be very clear: is that if I state something sounds like something, that is not a diagnosis. No. A diagnosis is a formal process where I submit a code to insurance and then they pay me. <laughs> um, that is what a diagnosis is. Otherwise, it's just a construct to describe a phenomenon of pathology. That's it. right. And that's so, the tricky thing, too, right? Is that this is all stuff that everybody experiences to an extent. Every show mm -hmm. I do like this, somebody emails me and says, I think I might have BPD. I think I might have OCD. I think I might. No, 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 no. It's everybody feels this kind of, it's the intensity of it that becomes i mean it's called a disorder for a reason correct yeah so imagine so i gotta this is a little bit of a descriptor but think about it like this imagine that you have such a vague sense of self that mm -hmm. the way you construct your sense of self is by um taking bits and pieces of the people around you. Uh -huh. now that sounds like a great plan until one of them leaves and when somebody disconnects or leaves or the relationship ends inevitably what often happens is the person in question will feel as though a part of them is being ripped out. And from yeah. a very real it is. experience perspective, it is. And yeah. so the thing is, they're left there bleeding out. And so when I talk about like the fear of abandonment, people think about that and they go, oh, well, everyone's afraid of abandonment. Right. It isn't to this pathological degree and it isn't something you will avoid at all costs. And also it isn't something that feels like the fear of death right like it's it's it when abandonment brings up existential terror that is the best way to describe it people with borderline often struggle with boundaries because yeah. again the fear of abandonment if making boundaries feels like conflict then why the hell would you ever engage in it so the uh because conflict can lead to abandonment so mm -hmm. it's, it's, again very simple math long story short is uh christmas comes along we were planning on going out to visit her um she lives in a relatively nearby state to us and it wasn't too far a drive about 500 miles and the day before this trip her and i get into a fight and the fight is about her a crossing a boundary again and b her crossing another boundary this prompts her to end the relationship and she then spends the day talking briefly with me who had to quit cancel clients because I was so upset. And okay. Zena, who was trying to work out the situation because we had already put time, money, and effort and, you know, Jenny would want to come out there and see her. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, and it came during a fight. So it was hard to tell of like, okay, wait, what, like, is this something that you genuinely intend to stick with? Or is this- like, Right. Or is this just you being reactive? And so what happened was, is uh, initially, you know, my responses were, you know, the typical sort of panicked begging um, though some have tried to through screenshots frame that as me being like coercive and abusive when really it's just me having a panic attack, very fun stuff. But Zena talked to, you know, throughout the day and kind of came to a realization of like, yeah, no, we should at least try to come out there and try to resolve things. And no agreed to that. That was something her as okay. you know, adult did too. This wasn't coercive. This wasn't anything. She just agreed to it. And, uh, what ended up happening was, is, you know, begrudgingly, we all kind of got together. Mm -hmm. Um, we met at a hotel in her town. And this was supposed to be over Christmas weekend. We were supposed to leave Christmas Eve. And what ended up happening was, is uh, Zena wasn't feeling well due to, you know, food issues on the road, IBS, all that stuff. And one of the times when Zena went to the bathroom, uh, her or me and me and no ended up starting to interact sexually. Mm -hmm. That went fine. There was no issue there. Where things got dicey was the second time Zena had been asleep. I had decided I wanted to sleep with no that night. Um, and what ended up happening was I initiated it uh, at least from the beginning. And immediately it sort of escalated and became much more intense. And I realized at the time that there was something off, but I couldn't figure out what. But every time I tried to even follow that thought, it just sort of shut down. I learned in hindsight that what was going on working with my own therapist and kind of doing my own personal work is that what this was, was sort of borderline. 
So the relationship was hanging by a thread. Yeah. I have this person who is in the midst of being sexual with me. Um, and, and not just sexual in like a typical way, but in the sense of I had had vaginoplasty in August um, of last year and had finally healed up enough where this was the first time that I could actually be physically intimate with a partner in that way. That was something I wanted to give to know. So okay. you have not only... That's intense. Was, yeah, Which very knew all of this beforehand. Yeah, yeah. This was all stuff that was very clear to her. Like this was so. This that was, was all a talked about and everything. Yeah, yeah. Huge conversations about this. But like, there, there is a way in which like, she knew all of this ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So this was an incredibly meaningful thing that I kind of tried to force myself to go through, and because my hope, I think my hope at the time was one, you know, that uh, by doing this, this would make her stay. Yeah. And two, seeing the specialness of it might. Uh, hopefully get her to acknowledge her feelings because it seemed like she still had them during the act she said i love you several times and so what ends up happening is is you know that ends um and the next morning um there was a misunderstanding about something there was a bit of an argument with myself and xena and xena made the decision that they wanted to fly home that day they said mm -hmm. you know what it seems like you two have some stuff to work out and i should go back home i can stay i can stay with people who who want me there and i can spend christmas with and as much as I didn't like it, I was willing to make it happen um, just because I figured that way I could focus on no and figure out what the hell's going on. No took this as an opportunity to decide to say fuck it. And she ended up saying she was leaving. She wasn't mm -hmm. coming back. And this proceeded in me, of course, having a breakdown on the ground, knees crying the whole nine yards. Well, yeah. Not my proudest moment, but... um. But if this was a man and a, a cisgender woman, yeah, nobody would question that reaction. No one, yeah, not even yeah. the slightest. But two, yeah, tra yeah, two yeah. trans women, it, it's, yeah. So the issue I got into was, is for some reason after No left, eventually she did leave. Yeah. And once she did, I started feeling really nauseous and really awful. And I couldn't put my finger onto why, but it was so bad that we ended up deciding to drive home that night. So we had to pay for an extra night being there because we, had, we hadn't gotten out in time, mm -hmm. but we got our other night we refunded, fine, whatever. So we drove home that night in the middle of the night from New, from from you know a nearby state. And mm -hmm. what ends up happening is, is we drive 500 miles back in the middle of the damn night. We get back. And I am already starting to show trauma reactions. Uh -huh. I am having a hard time in my own bedroom. The lighting and the size of it makes me claustrophobic. Um, I end up having to sleep with the doors open and keeping the lights on. Um, and I feel nauseous. I feel gross. I can't seem to make myself feel clean or better. Mm -hmm. And the whole time I just feel really awful, but I can't put my finger on to why. Okay. I reached out to know to figure out what was going on and one of the things that happened was there was a discussion about what happened between us and one of the and what she said in that conversation i'll just read it because it's, it's a little bit easier i kind of called her out and said like you lied to me like mm -hmm. you told me that you wanted to be with me physically because you loved me and cared about me and then told me the next day that you didn't love me and that this was all just a litmus test to see if you still cared mm -hmm. well, the big intention of us even going on this trip was okay you know we'll be in person we'll be able to kind of see and read each other's faces a lot better mm -hmm. you know so it kind of cuts out some of like the projection that can happen with online stuff and also but, like there really you was guys... the attention to work on things like yeah. that was the we are showing up with an intention to the stuff will get worked on mm -hmm. like so you guys had not met in person before this nope Everything was online. Our dates were usually over video. Um, yeah, I, I spent a tremendous amount of time with this person. Just to give you an insight, I downloaded. There's a there's 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 a, there's things you can get where you can download every message you've ever done over Facebook. Yeah, not Facebook. Excuse me. Um, Discord. My total messages with her from the middle of August when I had my vaginoplasty to the last day we talked, which was December twenty seventh, mm -hmm. was sixty three thousand one hundred and eight messages. Wow. Basically, every day I'd get up for work and in between clients, I would be talking to her until she went to sleep around three because mm -hmm. she worked midnight. And then we talked during the night while she was working. It just 
happen to work out that way. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, this is the point where a lot of people will get kind of trying to make your decisions for you. I know you've had people tell you, well, just, you know, cut out the poly, just don't do it, all that stuff. Uh, oh, I lost a job over it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think we have time to get into that. No, but... no, that's a whole separate story. But yeah, no, it's it's. I want so, you to I want you to put on your therapist hat for a minute sure. if if it's possible. I know this is super personal. Um and what's wrong with telling someone how to live their life in a situation like this? Um I mean honestly the big issue is is that it's invalidating as hell. Right. It also feels like a weird deflection. So in the case of the people who are like, well, I don't think you should be poly what they're ignoring in those situations is my relationship with Zena, my relationship mm -hmm. with my other partner, Sage, where sure there's issues, but there's nothing like this. The reason why this relationship was so explosive with no was that it was abusive. It was toxic. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't see it. There's a really great line from Bojack Horseman, which is, you know, if you're wearing rose colored glasses, all the red flags look like flags. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. a white split in a nutshell. Yeah. And that's that's the issue is. You know, I guess once you're in a long term relationship with Zena, with Sage, who is lovely, both mm -hmm. inside and out, um, the uh, that's safe when mm -hmm. you're meeting new. I mean, this is all very, very complicated. And what's interesting about your particular story is a lot of people are, would be like, I can't I couldn't I, you know, but this has worked for you. It sounds like up until this point, you've you well, haven't well, had it. Yeah. The big yep. thing for abuse that I always want to remind mm -hmm. people is that anyone can get into an abusive relationship. It doesn't matter if you're a clinician. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you, you know, work with this stuff and you point it out. It doesn't matter. Like yeah. anyone can get into an abusive relationship with anyone. It could be a friendship, it could be, you know, a longer term relationship, anything. Like, so these are dynamics that just creep in over time. Well, no, that just happened immediately, usually. Yeah. Right. You know, you, I didn't know some of these details until now. So I'm sitting here going, oh, it's worse than I thought. Um, <laughs> in hindsight, to help other people, when was the abuse? When did you know, like, know in hindsight? Yeah, that was the point that it became abusive. I think I figured out it was abusive with no, probably within a day or two. I think that was something you and I had been talking about the whole way back and just everything and going over it. And I think that was something we came to pretty quickly. So the thing I was going to bring up a little bit earlier was that um, I had a message from her. I told her how gross I felt, how much she had kind of tainted these experiences for me. And her response was as follows. It's, I lied about the sex stuff. I'm truly sorry for doing so. You, initi you were initiating in my mind. I did still have feelings. In my mind, I still had feelings for you. I wanted to make you happy. I'm not blaming you for the record. I, gen I genuinely cared and wanted to make you feel amazing during that. The next day, my head started to clear. Zizi wanted to leave, myself having time to think and see how I was reacting to you and the issues coming back up. I realized my feelings weren't there anymore. I had a lot of thoughts of why am I even bothering? This was a mistake. I tried to force myself to still love you, but I couldn't. I'm so, so sorry, Poppy. I don't know. I don't know how to make things better even just to be friends i don't know how i could possibly make up for the shit i put you through and the reason i wanted to share that is is that this was it, five hours before my friend and editor for our channel P uh, penelope told me that i was assaulted when i told her what happened she goes you were sexually assaulted and it took me a good couple hours to come to the realization of that being the case because I also have biases. I also have things uh -huh. I, and I didn't at the time, but it started to click into place as to why I felt so gross and why things felt so off. And I went back and read this and I realized it reads exactly similar to those Reddit forums where they're like, hey, someone who's committed sexually assault accidentally, what is your story? It literally reads like one of those posts where the person's intentions were irrelevant because what they did was coercive and still... And a non-consensual act. Even if it was not, that's basically a how not to break up with someone with borderline. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And again, in this case, it is. Because as I pointed out, like, yeah. there's two things going on here. Is There's the, this is a partner who I had informed through dozens of articles, through mm -hmm. several talks. I think that's the hardest part is that, like, our story is almost a cautionary tale too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because the problem is, is like you can warn someone, you can tell someone, you can give everyone 
you know, give someone every ounce of data mm-hmm. and they can't come to the conclusions they need to, because if she had just stopped and thought for five seconds and went, oh, having the relationship dangling there like a carrot on a stick means mm-hmm. that there yes. is no way that Poppy can make a decision because she's so focused on, you know, the carrot that this becomes an issue of where this is why I felt so gross afterwards, mm-hmm. even before she left, because something felt off to me about that situation. And then when she left and I found out that even the care she expressed during. Yeah. Was in her words, a lie. Yeah. Her saying like, yeah, I don't, I don't love you anymore. And going, but wait, this. so what was last night? Was it just like a, a right. litmus test? Like that's the whole reason you were here is to see if you still like, and she said, yes, that was the case. So like mm-hmm. the issue is, is that like, it becomes a problem of like, now we have two issues. There's the, con- there's the consent issue because of mental illness. Right. And there's the sexual assault via deception. And then there's the, the abusive breakup based on what not to do with somebody with borderline. Oh, I've literally said that the getting out of this relationship, I still struggle with. I think I've talked to you about this. In DM. Yeah, I've yeah, talked yeah, to several yeah, people. yeah. And like one of the things that I, I I can only do is I keep thinking of the line from uh there's a there, I can only keep thinking of the song by uh, Nine Inch Nails uh the perfect drug yeah I just keep thinking about that because that's what this feels like it feels like withdrawal it feels like yep. I've never had a relationship where I I like thought I was in rehab like and it just has that vibe now Zena you're you're watching this all go down you're trying to support poppy through all this did you have a sense something was really wrong and you didn't know what to do what was going on because i mean you're yeah you're involved you're harmed by this too no this this shows some of the roughest stuff because like Mm -hmm. i remember talking to poppy late the night before it happened Mm -hmm. um you know like i was still sick in the bathroom but like she looked super intense and um I don't know the best word for it, but like manic almost comes to mind. Like that, oh, okay. that feeling of just like she had, she felt like she had to like keep going and keep being like there with no and keep figuring things, like keep trying. Mm-hmm. Um, and even before all of this, like there was a lot of situations that were going south. Mm-hmm. You know, and and so for a while, like the best thing that I had was just support Poppy and just hold on to her. One, you know, was wonky or just be there for her when things were okay. And- mm-hmm. So were you kind of frozen by watching it kind of decay in slow motion? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I guess I felt frozen a lot of times. Um, A lot of it was also enraging, but a lot of that I just kind of had to put aside. Because again, Poppy's still in all of this. Like, she's still in, like, at the time, she was still in the middle of it. So in your Um, opinion, she was too far in to reason with? Yeah. Well, that's a sign that consent couldn't be given right there, yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Like there were, Poppy, you okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, just okay. Listen, just listening and thinking. I'm trying to okay. think if there's anything else to add. I um, yeah. well, I I want to land in a good place because you guys are still together. So when we come back, uh, on our final segment, I'm gonna keep Poppy and Zena here. If you have questions, comments, concerns, Leanna at nottherapyshow.com. Nottherapyshow.com uh, is the website. Fill out the contact form. But when we come back, I want briefly, because we don't have a ton of time, Poppy, Zena, what got you through this? What relationship advice can you give when we come back on It's Not Therapy? The following program is a peer-to-peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. We're back and it's not therapy. I'm still Leanna Kirstner. I'm still not a therapist. I'm still talking to Poppy and Zena. Uh, Poppy is a therapist uh, and we're talking about mental health and consent. Poppy was in a situation because of her borderline personality disorder where she was not able to freely and in, from an informed place give consent. And Zena had to hang on for the ride. How do you make this very, very complicated set of circumstances? How do you make this work? You've been together how long now? Uh, it's going to be, what, seven years in May? Yeah. 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 How do you make this work? You just keep trying day by day. Like, that's the biggest thing is like, at the beginning of the relationship, Poppy got into therapy real fast. So did I. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And she actually got, that was actually when she got the diagnosis for BPD. We did a lot of work then. And that's been saving our butts now lately. You know, like, and we both deal with flashbacks. Sometimes our flashbacks will crisscross and like exasperate those flashbacks. And like afterwards, we tend to just let that stuff go and just hug it out afterwards. Okay. One of the big practices too that we started around that time was that we go over uh you know the flashback or the panic attack or whatever a little bit and just kind of restate anything that we need to so like if you said something like kind of awful or Mm -hmm. that like no you really don't mean we would re-say that to we would re-say whatever it is that we actually mean to our to each other to to rewrite the memory of it Yes. Yep. So that way you still have a memory of them saying, you know, the positive thing. You still have said it all over again. I mean, yeah. in all honesty, Poppy and I are still really, I still have trouble sleeping. Poppy still has trouble sleeping. Like, this stuff's really froth. Um, I think the thing I'd add to like, mm-hmm. what Zizi's saying is, like, mm-hmm. I think the thing for me is, like, I'll, I'll be honest. Like, some of our fights, especially early on in the relationship with No, were, were some of the worst fights we've had. That's, mm-hmm. yeah. And, um, and the whole time, you know, Zena's basically just strapped into the ride. They can't mm-hmm. do anything. They can't um they can't really, you know, do much because, you know, they can push on me all they want and say, you know, this person's a problem. I don't want them around. I don't want this. But Zena figured out really early on that none of that works. It yeah. all, all it does yeah. is make me dig my heels in. Yeah. So we, we had to figure out a new way to engage with it. As far as like the long term stuff, I think the big thing is aftercare after fights. Mm-hmm. And, you know, making sure that like no matter how knocked down drag out the fight gets, like you care for the other person you try to make amends you you try to hold to the things you care about obviously you don't just Mm -hmm. cave but you make amends for any harms i mean a good part of this is like having your own like rules for fights like what is allowed what isn't i i love that saying the positive thing actively after something hurtful is said instead of just saying i didn't mean it so you guys are content creators so plug your stuff people can uh check you out Sure. Um, you can find us on YouTube at Zena and Poppy. Uh, we we go by Zena and Poppy, Wholesome Degenerates, and we uh, talk about everything from mental illness, mental health, to uh, trans rights, to uh, just politics in general. But yeah, we've been off for a couple months. We're going to be starting back up again soon. Right. You can also follow us on Twitter at Zena and Poppy. So that should be solid. That's, uh, as we say in Canada, Z-E-N-A <laughs> and Poppy. Z-E-N-A, down where y'all are. Uh, I, I I agree with the, the Canadian. So it's have, one less thing I, to get used over yeah, the phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Zena, <laughs> Poppy, thank you so much. Zena, I apologize if I accidentally misgendered you at any point in this interview. I missed to say them. Questions, comments, concerns, Leanna at NotTherapyShow.com or fill out the contact form, join our mailing list on NotTherapyShow.com. I'm NotTherapyShow on X, that's Twitter, Instagram, and Threads reds really short on time remember your crazy is only a problem if it's hurting someone else or you get consent talk next time